Today we're going to talk about pharmacogenetics testing. This is a platform, a, a program that we're starting with uh, UofL through the Department of Medicine. Uh, it's one of the initiatives that Dr. Roman had uh, begun uh, late last year. And so PGXL Laboratories is a lab that actually spun out of UofL's Department of Pathology several years ago. And we are still affiliated with UofL, even though we're um, technically a private entity. Um, but I, for example, am a, a lab operations over at PGXL in, in the lab itself, uh, but I'm also a gratis faculty member uh, here at the department doing a lot of different teaching, uh, et cetera. So uh, today I'm just going to talk to you about what this program is. Just disclosure, I am an employee of a pharmacogenetics lab, like I mentioned. Uh, today we're going to just give you a, a flavor of uh, how genetic variations affect drug response uh, and dose requirement, give you a little bit of pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics, and, and how genetics in both of those arms play a role in this type of, of drug response. I'm going to show you some examples in psych, in uh, uh, cardiovascular medicine, and in pain management. Um, I'm going to show you how to consider what patients should be tested. So what are patient selection criteria? Who are the candidates for this type of testing? And uh, go a, bit, a little bit into uh, logistics for how, to, for how to go about doing testing. So let's just do a little bit of background here. Adverse drug reactions are a leading cause of death in this country. And it's important to note that the ADRs in these studies were not the cause of a patient getting an accidental overdose or accidentally being given the wrong drug. These were patients who were candidates for the med based on their diagnosis, uh, but ultimately uh, the conventional dose proved to be toxic for the patients. And what we know year in and year out is 60% of the meds that always are in the top 20 that cause serious ADRs are linked to a genetic characteristic. So we have a profound opportunity to identify patients at increased risk of, of adverse drug reactions and thereby uh, reduce the likelihood of those ADRs coming to fruition. Uh, the FDA and other regulatory agencies are certainly um, recognizing the utility of these types of pharmacogenetic markers. Um, there are over 120 drugs that now have pharmacogenetic information in their labels. Many of these drugs are old drugs that have been relabeled as we've learned more about the genetic characteristics. An important one I'll mention today is Plavix or Clopidogrel. Uh, that drug's been out for, what, a decade or so, maybe longer. Uh, and in 2010, there was a black box warning added uh, to the label of clopidogrel indicating that poor metabolizers should avoid that medication. So we see these old drugs relabeled as well as new drugs as they come on the market, uh, having those biomarkers when we know what they are already indicated with dose adjustments associated with those. And again, I'll give you some examples of this. This is a, another study that shows the top 10 classes of medications that cause ADRs uh, severe enough to lead to hospitalization. I'm showing in red the 60% that are linked to genetic characteristics that we can test for today. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, uh, metabolized in the liver, decreased metabolism means you have more uh, anti-inflammatory in the blood, which means you're at increased risk of uh, toxic side effects like bleeding. In fact, there have been studies that demonstrate if you have a particular variant, you're at 7.3-fold increased risk of a gastrointestinal bleed uh, following non-steroidal use. So these are, even, even when we're talking about uh, over-the-counter medications, these genetic characteristics can be quite, uh, quite, quite profound in terms of their clinical uh, ramifications. Certainly warfarin, antidepressants, beta blockers, opiates, uh, and clopidogrel, as I mentioned before. Again, top 10, 60% of which have an identifiable risk factor with genetic testing. So what are the goals of pharmacogenetic testing? If we can identify people at risk of adverse drug reactions, well, certainly then a goal should be to reduce those adverse reactions, right? Kind of no-brainer. Um, but what about reducing the cost of the ADR? 
What about improving therapeutic outcomes? Not just decreasing the likelihood that you're going to have a problem, but what about improving therapeutic efficacy, improving success, decreasing the time to reach therapeutic goal? What type of, of success would that manifest as, and how could we decrease costs there? Think about a warfarin patient uh, with a genetic variant takes three months longer to stabilize than a patient without a genetic variant. Uh, so what are the costs associated with three months longer uh, warfarin uh, instability? In terms of, of a, an institutional setting, the goals of pharmacogenetic testing might be to decrease things like length of stay, post-surgical patient, pain management, not, uh, not uh, receiving any pain benefit from their orals. They're in the hospital four days longer, according to most studies. Um, and most of those patients who are failing their therapies actually have a deficiency in one of these variants. So not only can we improve uh, or decrease the time it takes that post-surgical patient to achieve uh, therapeutic analgesia, we can also decrease the costs by getting them out of the hospital faster. So both of those goals are achieved by incorporating pharmacogenetics into post-surgical pain management options. Okay, um, And certainly as... Uh, Dr. Roman wanted to initiate his center of excellence here at U of L, a personalized medicine center of excellence. Um, the goal is to improve uh, outreach opportunities, so to have more faculty at your facility, to have more patients come to your facility. All good things for uh, for an institutional setting, but aren't necessarily associated with uh, decreasing ADRs, as we often think about the primary goal being. The strength of evidence for pharmacogenetic testing is pretty diverse. Um, I'm going to show you a couple examples, like I said, in behavioral health and pain management and cardiovascular med, um, but it's really across the board. When we think about these big three, the, the CV, pain, and psych, certainly uh, a lot of that transposes over into internal medicine at a, at a primary care or general practice level. Um, about 75% of antidepressants are written at primary care not by psychiatrists. So when I talk about the effects of these genetic variants for antidepressant choice and dosage, think about uh, this isn't something that applies only at the psychiatrist's office. Okay? And we'll go through several of these examples, as I mentioned. Okay, so a little bit of Q&A here. Uh, just yell out when you know the answer. Pharmaco dis pharmacokinetics describes what? A, B, C, D. Don't all answer at once. A. A, exactly, what the body does to the drug. So when we're talking about pharmacokinetics, we're really talking about um, how well the drug is absorbed, how well it becomes bioavailable, what its metabolic fate is, right? But also how well or how poorly it gets transported to its, trans, uh, to its receptor of interest, okay? What is pharmacodynamics? Okay, so that would be B, right? What the, what the drug does to the body. The reason you take the drug to begin with, right? The, the reason you're trying to get that therapeutic effect. So again, um, when we think about genetic, pharmacogenetic biomarkers for drug response and dose requirement, we're not just trying to decrease toxicity, which is most usually associated with that pharmacokinetic or that metabolic characteristic, but we're also trying to pick the drugs that are most likely to be efficacious. And quite often, efficacy is not about how much drug you have in the system. It's about whether or not the receptor for that drug um, can even bind the drug itself. So that's the pharmacodynamic aspects. So both characteristics will dramatically affect how well or poorly a person responds to a medication, but each of those genetic characteristics affects it in very different mechanisms, and it's really important to understand which one's at play. So let's talk about those metabolic ones for a minute. The cytochrome P450s, as I'm sure you remember, are, are the majority of the phase one metabolic fate in the liver. Uh, they're, it's an entire superfamily. Um, and some of the more common ones um, are accounted for in most pharmacogenetic profiles these days, which can account for about 85 to 90 percent of, of any drug that has uh, a liver uh, metabolic fate. <clears throat> 
Um, when we think about phenotypes, we often refer to these categorical phenotypes, normal or extensive metabolizers. Those are guys who basically have two normal copies. Remember, we get one copy of a gene from mom and one copy from dad. So every time I report a genotype, I'm reporting a diploid characteristic, a copy of each. Okay? So people who have two normal active copies of a gene are called normal or extensive metabolizers. And those are the guys who basically have average metabolic capacity and would require about average doses, okay, the conventional dose of a med. Intermediate metabolizers have a deficiency, but they're not completely devoid, okay? They have one good copy from mom, one bad copy from dad, for example, bad copy being inactive. So these folks have, roughly speaking, 50% activity of normal. So they're not devoid, but they're an intermediate. So these are folks who might need lower than average doses of active medications in order to avoid that, that likelihood of toxic side effects. Okay? They're also at increased risk of drug-drug interactions because they might be taking one med uh, and have basically... Uh, right, sitting right there at the, um, at the limit of their, their metabolic capacity for that drug. As soon as you add another drug in, you've supersaturated the, the clearance rate and the patient begins to have, uh, adverse events based on the drug, drug interaction. So increased risk of not only increased blood concentrations, but drug, drug interactions. The poor metabolizers, um, have no active copies. They have two bad copies, so to speak, of the gene. And these are ones who not only often need dose adjustments, but in many cases actually should avoid the drug altogether. But not in every case. That's something that I hear a lot is, well, if the patient's a poor metabolizer, then I'm just going to avoid every drug that goes through that pathway. And unfortunately, there are a lot of clinical situations where you cannot avoid every drug that goes through that pathway. These pathways are extremely common uh, routes of elimination for meds. So you can't always avoid it. So understanding how to alter the dosage uh, becomes really important. And then there's this last phenotype, which is not present in every cytochrome. And it's called ultra-rapid metabolizer. These are the folks who have truly hyperfunctional, more amounts of metabolic uh, uh, clearance rate uh, than normal. And these are folks who often need higher than average doses of active meds, okay? Um, because if they're hyper-metabolizing it, they're burning through a standard dose so quickly, their blood concentrations never get therapeutic, right? So these are folks who might need a higher than average dose. But it's important to note that not all Genes, not all cytochromes have an ultra rapid metabolizer phenotype. Big example is warfarin. Warfarin, there is no such thing as a hyper active or a, a, a ultra rapid metabolizer of that gene for the 2C9 cytochrome. All the people who have uh, warfarin high dose requirement are typically pharmacodynamically resistant to warfarin. The problem is the vitamin K epoxide reductase enzyme that warfarin inhibits. It's really not metabolic in nature. So again, I go back to that concept that it's really important to understand the functional consequence of the gene we're looking at because it's actually much less common to see ultra-rapid or really fast metabolism even in people who require really high doses. And you make different decisions based on knowledge that they have really fast metabolism, you just increase the dose, versus they have a blunted receptor response. They're never going to respond no matter how dose, how high the dose gets. Okay? These are just some uh, frequencies of the most common cytochrome variants, for example, and a couple other genes. Uh, I'll mention one here. Cytochrome 2D6 uh, metabolizes a quarter of all medications. A quarter of all meds go through this one pathway. Only... 53% of the general population are considered normal or extensive metabolizers for a quarter of all medications. Another 47% of the population has some variant in that pathway uh, that causes them to need lower or possibly higher than average doses, again, for a quarter of all medications. And as you look through the variant column there on the far right, you can basically see that these are extremely common phenotypes that have very uh, uh, significant clinical impacts. So let's talk a little bit about behavioral health. Uh, when we look at strength of evidence, we're looking at meds that treat depression, treatment-resistant depression, 
psychoses like bipolar and schizophrenia, for example, uh, anxiety, ADHD. We have biomarkers to help predict efficacy and tolerability of meds that treat all of these different things. Not only can we predict efficacy and tolerability at a particular dose level, we also have markers that can help you understand when you give olanzapine to a patient with schizophrenia instead of risperidone, you can decrease the likelihood that patient's going to have a schizophrenic episode by 80%. Decrease the hospitalization rate by 80%. So again, I go back to the concept that we may be thinking about pharmacogenetics in terms of how we can avoid adverse drug reactions, but the downstream ramifications of picking the right medicine earlier in the clinical course have much more uh, outcomes associated with them than just he didn't have a toxic side effect. Some of the most commonly prescribed psychiatric meds uh, and, their, uh, and their genes of interest, some pharmacokinetic, like the cytochrome, some are pharmacodynamic. I'll go through those in just a second. This gives you just a, a, a feel for how common uh, these variants are in, in um, causing a lot of the rates of treatment-resistant depression and treatment-refractory uh, psychoses. This is a model of how drug levels accumulate as a function of clearance. The example here is for the cytochrome 2D6 clearance pathway and an atomoxetine, which is Stratera, um, uh, an AD, a common ADHD med. But it's just basically a substrate for 2D6 as far as we're concerned here. This is the model for how you think about every metabolic pharmacogenetic variant, okay? What is accumulating? What's happening to the clearance rate? And what is accumulating? In this example, Stratera, or atomoxetine, is an active drug, meaning um, its parent form is the active moiety, okay, that's the SNRI. Uh, normal or extensive metabolizers taking a standard dose of atomoxetine uh, will achieve these therapeutic concentrations shown in green in the first couple days because it has a pretty short half-life. Com contrast that to a patient who is a 2D6 poor metabolizer. First thing you notice when they take the same standard 20 milligram Q12 dose is their blood concentrations are four times higher. So they're four times supra-therapeutic uh, compared to a normal metabolizer on the same dose. The more subtle thing is how much longer it took them to achieve that plateau or that steady state uh, uh, reproducible concentration, okay? So that is affecting not only how much, but how long it takes them to get there, and subsequently then, how much longer it takes them to wash out. A delay in the time to accumulate means a delay in the time to wash out as well, okay? But once we understand that the functional consequence of that genetic poor metabolizer is decreased clearance, we can do a simple recalculation using fundamental pharmacokinetic calculations uh, and get that dose right back into the therapeutic range for a poor metabolizer. In this example, um, it's a 50% dose reduction from standard. And you can see that takes uh, a poor metabolizer going from 20 milligram to 10 milligrams, puts them smack dab in the middle of the therapeutic range. The other more subtle thing to notice uh, is that the peak troughs don't vary as much. So they actually uh, are more stable. Their blood concentrations are even more stable because they don't vary so much. Okay. Aripiprazole, or Abilify, uh, the leading selling drug in 2013, Abilify, antipsychotic, looks the exact same way. Metabolized by 2D6, a normal metabolizer or extensive metabolizer, shown in green, taking a standard dose right there in the therapeutic range. Poor metabolizer taking that same dose, almost four times the blood concentrations much more likely to experience toxic side effects, and for, for antipsychotics, they're pretty profound. Um, and right there in the package insert, right in the Abilify monograph, uh, the day it was cleared, it had pharmacogenetic information that said, give 2D6 poor metabolizers half the dose. So if any of you has ever written aripiprazole and didn't know that this was in the package insert, now you've learned something about that. I get a lot of questions from physicians about what's my liability uh, when I now know that a person has a genetic characteristic. What's my liability if I don't do something about it? And the more and more this information gets into the product labels and into guidelines and into black box warnings, the more I, uh, uh, we say 
What's your liability if you don't do the test, knowing that it's right there in the package insert with a dose modification? Okay? The good news is, is that we can identify these things rapidly now, and we have something we can do about it. Give them 50% dose reduction. Okay? Peroxetine, just another 2D6 substrate, looks exactly the same way. This is Paxil, okay? Uh, so again, I, I'm showing you these just to reiterate the point that this is the model. This is how you think about metabolic variants. If they don't have uh, good, strong clearance, what's happening? They're accumulating the drug, okay? Puts them at risk of, of side effects, okay? But remember, the metabolic characteristics are only half of the uh, half of the equation. The other half are the receptors or the the transporters, the chaperones, whatever that target uh, of of the drug actually is. And for something like an SSRI, for example, the target ends up being the serotonin transporter in the brain. Uh, SSRIs inhibit serotonin reuptake by binding to the serotonin transporter and inhibiting its function. There's a variant in the serotonin transporter gene referred to as SLC6A4, um, which causes there to be less serotonin transporter produced, expressed, 50% less. Okay, um, So if you have less serotonin transporter in the brain, you have less target for those SSRIs to bind to and, in, and elicit the, the antidepressant effect. Okay? These patients are over two-fold more likely to fail SSRIs uh, and to be what is considered SSRI resistant. Uh, they're also over two-fold more likely to experience side effects and adverse drug reactions to the SSRIs without any benefit of them. Okay? Um, so we actually think about the serotonin transporter as being the first line for, for antidepressant therapy. We did a study last year of 705 patients came to us from all across the country, um, and we assessed their specific drugs that they were taking at the time of testing against their genetic profiles. Uh, and what we found in this particular cohort of 705 patients was that of the folks taking an SSRI, 87% had at least one genetic variant for the SSRI they were particularly prescribed. And that broke down as 40% had a single gene conflict. Either the cytochrome, either the metabolism was bad, or the transporter was bad. Another 47% of them had dual genetic variants. Okay, So they had a bad serotonin transporter and they had low metabolic function, which put them at significantly increased risk of not only not having uh, improvement in their depression symptoms, but also increased likelihood of significant side effects. Okay, So these are extremely common variants uh, in the general population that lead to uh, dramatic clinical outcomes. And this was just in 705 patients that came to us from across the country. So again, that, that continuum of risk, we know treatment-resistant depression happens in up to 50% of patients who are uh, originally uh, uh, diagnosed with depression. Um, and we know that 75% of the time, the first line uh, therapeutic is an SSRI, three-quarters of the time. Um, but we know that if we use the serotonin transporter, we can identify those people with SSRI resistance who probably need to be treated with an SNRI or maybe one of the atypicals, maybe even going back to a tricyclic antidepressant. In fact, many of the patients we see who have been on three different SSRIs who finally get tested, and of course their variant by that point, uh, they get put on a tricyclic. So we think of tricyclics as being like third line for depression, uh, but it actually can be um, a, a big difference in these patients who have the, the, the double variants. Um, but again, once you understand that they can go on an SSRI, for example, you can begin to do the dose titration process per guidelines uh, once you understand the cytochrome variants and the risk of, of dose escalation in those patients. So that's how uh, you can begin to use a panel of genes uh, to select not only the right class of medications, but also the particular drug at the particular dosage. This is an example of one of our real patients from that 705 cohort. The patient was on Celexa, or citalopram, uh, the fifth most common antidepressant uh, uh, written. Uh, and that one is metabolized by cytochrome 2C19. This patient was an ultra-rapid metabolizer, which means 
metabolically speaking, you'd think he'd need a higher than average dose, right? Just to, just to get those blood concentrations higher, uh, high enough. However, he was a serotonin transporter poor responder, which indicates an increased risk of subtherapeutic response. Uh, therefore, we actually recommended uh, a switch to a non-SSRI that wasn't uh, affected by that 2C19 ultra-rapid metabolizer phenotype, but we actually tested him for 2D62, and he was a poor metabolizer. So we actually had a triple hit. It made it really difficult to select an antidepressant for this patient that wasn't uh, likely to be affected by a significant pharmacogenetic variant. So we recommended three, desvenlafaxine or Pristique, Welbutrin, and Deserel for this particular patient. Okay, but that's the way um, you f- you begin to to look at. Well, I'm just interested in a particular drug. This patient's on citalopram. All I want to know is the genetics for citalopram. But the problem is, when the genetics for citalopram are bad, we need to be able to provide you alternative options. Actionable information is what you need to get out of these things. You don't want me to just tell you that citalopram is bad. Pick something else, right? Um, so we have to have the rest of the genetic panel to be able to choose safer alternatives. Questions? Cool. Sorry, I meant to turn off the animation. Uh, in pain management, there have been studies that have demonstrated that 80% of patients who have adverse reaction to opioids have a 2D6 metabolic uh, uh, deficiency. Okay, 2D6 metabolizes a lot of the pro-drug opioids, as you can see here, um, like hydrocodone, um, oxycodone, codeine, tramadol, those guys are all prodrugs that have to be activated by that cytochrome 2D6 into their active component to, to elicit analgesic effect. Um, but I don't have just opioids here. I mentioned the non-steroidals a few minutes ago. Uh, a lot of the tryptans go through these pathways. Muscle relaxers go through these pathways. So even when you're not considering an opioid for a patient, a lot of those alternatives uh, are affected by these as well. So I mentioned that pro-drug concept. It's really important when you think about these metabolic characteristics uh, to understand what's happening to the clearance rate. But then you have to understand what part of what type of drug is accumulating when you have decreased clearance. Is it an active drug or is it an inactive drug? So the most common pro-drugs shown right here, most common active drugs, morphine, hydromorphone, that, that active uh, component, for example. Codeine, being the example uh, prodrug, uh, is activated by 2D6 into morphine, and it's morphine that gets into the brain, binds to the mu1 opioid receptor in the brain, and elicits the analgesic effect. Okay, and 2D6 poor metabolizers, they don't produce morphine; they have no analgesic effect. Ten percent of the population are poor metabolizers and will fail codeine therapy for lack of effect. Okay, and they might still have side effects. Uh, the other side of the coin is ultra-rapid metabolism. About 2% of the population are ultra-rapid metabolizers. They make more morphine per codeine dose than they're supposed to. So those are the folks who are at risk of morphine toxicity, respiratory depression, coma, and even death. In fact, there have been several safety advisories on this. Um, so same gene, completely different phenotype for a pro-drug, Right. This is what our version of the report looks like. So when you order a 2D6, uh, this is what the report would look like. Um, we say the patient is a poor metabolizer, and we color code it, red, green, yellow. Um, and this is a bad one, obviously. And then we have the therapeutic implications uh, based on consensus published uh, literature. So right here, the very first line, we say avoid codeine and consider alternatives like morphine or some other non-opioid, again, that wouldn't be affected by 2D6 metabolism. And you can see there are a whole host of meds that a poor metabolizer of 2D6 should probably just avoid. There are alternative considerations for those that aren't affected by the 2D6, as well as a whole host of meds that you don't have to avoid, but simply need a dose modification in order to decrease that risk. Make sense? Actionable information meant to be at a glance. Okay, you look at this table and you know what their phenotype is, you know what to avoid, you know what to consider as alternatives. Okay, so again, I mentioned this. When you understand what the clearance change is, then ask yourself what part of the drug is accumulating, okay? And this is the way you're going to be able to answer 
uh, do anything with pharmacogenetic information if you can get this down. When you're a poor metabolizer, you have decreased metabolic activity. That means something's accumulating. If it's an active drug, that which is accumulating is active and likely to lead to toxic side effects. If what's accumulating is a pro-drug parent compound, you're likely to have therapeutic failure, right? No active metabolite. Opposite is true for ultra-rapid metabolizers. In clear, increased clearance, what's accumulating in an active drug? Mm. The metabolite. The, the inactive metabolite would be that which you're producing and accumulating. So you're going to have therapeutic uh, failure. Whereas an ultra-rapid metabolizer taking a pro-drug, they're actually going to uh, accumulate active metabolite and be at risk of, of, of therapeutic, um, of, of toxic side effects. Okay? I know, clear as mud, right? Okay, lack of analgesic effect uh, to an opioid is associated with which phenotype? It, if you are taking codeine and you're not getting any pain relief, what phenotype could that be? C. Very good. Because you're accumulating inactive metabolite, right? You're not producing active moiety. Uh, this is from one of our papers a couple years ago, looking at what is accumulating in poor versus uh, normal metabolizers. Hydrocodone dosing produces hydromorphone. Here we've got therapeutic hydromorphone produced in normal metabolizers and uh, non or subtherapeutic uh, hydromorphone accumulating in those poor metabolizers. Okay, morphine. Overdose in children taking codeine is a rare but con a serious consequence of which phenotype? Exactly. Exactly. In fact, this is the data uh, from two different safety advisories in 2012 and 2013 uh, that required all codeine-containing products to be relabeled with the risk factors for ultra-rapid metabolism through 2D6 and to avoid codeine-containing products in those patients. Okay. Any questions about pain management? All right, let me show you clopidogrel. Clopidogrel is a prodrug, has to be activated by 2C19. 30% of the population have a 2C19 deficiency, which means they're not going to produce enough active moiety, which puts them at a 4% absolute increased risk of CV events, including uh, acute myocardial infarction, death, stroke, and stent thrombosis. It's this data in 2010 that mandated relabeling re of the clopidogrel insert uh, to avoid it in poor metabolizers. Uh, there's the package insert right there. The last line says consider alternatives uh, in patients with 2C19 poor metabolizer phenotype. And the guidelines actually go even further uh, to demonstrate what you can consider for patients who have the other phenotypes as well. Okay. This is what the, the report actually looks like for 2C19 clopidogrel. Again, in a poor metabolizer, avoid clopidogrel. Consider one of the two uh, other antiplatelets that are not metabolized by 2C19, so they are not affected. Okay. These are the safer alternatives for these patients. When we think about who to test, it's not about testing everybody across the board. Although there can be an argument made that the sooner you know this information and have it at the ready when you do need to prescribe a new med, the better off you'll be. However, that data could sit somewhere for 10 years before it ever becomes uh, useful uh, in an otherwise healthy person who's not on any meds. Okay, um, So we've built um, focused patient selection criteria based on the strength of evidence, okay, based on that which we can tell you the most about. So when we think about a pain patient, certainly uh, anyone who's being considered for one of those pro-drug opioids is a candidate for testing because of their risk of failing therapy or their risk of a significant um, respiratory depression, 
Okay. Uh, or a patient who's already on a prodrug who's having significant side effects or who's suboptimal, who's already on really high doses and he's not uh, uh, achieving therapeutic effect yet. Those are all patients who are already demonstrating an alternative phenotype uh, that the, that the uh, genetics can actually help you diagnose and make alternative decisions on. Um, not so much important in a hospital setting, but certainly in pain management settings, abnormal urine drug screen testing. Um, I had a patient a couple years ago who, a 42-year-old male, chronic back pain, been through three different pain management clinics and been released for uh, potential diversion and noncompliance. He was prescribed hydrocodone. They did three months' worth of urine drug screens and never found hydromorphone in his urine. They were convinced he was spiking his urine uh, and diverting the rest of it. He was a poor metabolizer once we finally genotyped him. His liver doesn't produce hydromorphone. It will not show up in his urine. Therefore, his urine drug screen looked exactly like it should have based on his genetics. But it took the third pain management clinic to realize that his phenotype could have been explained by genetics and not by diversion. So a lot of these people look like pain seek- or, uh, or drug seekers when they're really pain seekers. So that's an important characteristic. And then, of course, we mentioned a lot of those other pain meds uh, that, that uh, have genetic relevance as well. In the behavioral health space, a patient with new depression, a first-onset depression, before you select an SSRI, you probably want to understand whether they're resistant to the SSRI class overall. Uh, or a patient who's already demonstrating treatment resistance. Uh, a patient who's on two or more psychotropics at once is more likely, like 69 times more likely, to have one of these variants. There have been a bunch of different studies demonstrating how profoundly common these variants are in patients who demonstrate treatment resistance to the psychotropics. In cardiovascular, it's a little all over the place. We just talked about, we talked about um, clopidogrel, but a lot of the other anticoagulants go through these pathways. Statins, there's a marker that predicts a five-fold increased risk to myopathy in patients treated with simvastatin. All you need to do is pick a different statin to understand that. But, but if simvastatin happens to be on a formulary, and that's the most common thing that gets written there, you've got about 20% of the population uh, who are going to have a significant myopathy risk associated with that particular drug. It's simple. Just pick one of the other ones. So you can see here we've got a lot of different types of, of patient selection considerations, patients who, who would demonstrate uh, a risk factor who would need this testing. Um, but it's very rare uh, in patients these days uh, for them to have just one of these things. In that 700 patient cohort we did last year, the average number of meds each patient was taking was 12. So it's very rare that you'd look at one of your patients and say, well, he's got chronic pain, and I'm considering putting him on an opioid or switching his opioid, so I'm going to get the testing because he falls into the middle the middle funnel, the pain funnel. He's probably also got depression because uh, more than half of patients with chronic pain have depression. So we begin to think about how uh, the overall patient is burdened uh, by these genetic risk factors, not only for the condition you might be treating them for today, but that their cardiologist treated them for three weeks ago and their psychiatrist treated them, you know, two months ago, okay? So this idea of polypharmacy is a significant risk factor uh, and a... And a um, factor to consider uh, testing these patients in and of themselves. We have created a patient selection criteria form uh, for use at UofL clinics that we're rolling out as part of this initiative. And this is just basically to, to highlight for you some of the things we just looked at on that prior slide. What are the things that have the strongest evidence uh, with pharmacogenetic relevance, and to remind you these are the types of things you might want to consider. But I I know this is small and you may not be able to see it, but the bottom basically says none of the above. Look, if the patient isn't on any of those meds and doesn't have a condition that would imply he'd need to go on one of those types of meds in the next month or two, then maybe he's not a candidate for testing right now. So uh, again, um, we've got this form available uh, to, to begin to help everyone learn how to think about these these patient selection criteria.
This is what the full version of the report looks like. When you send a test to me and you provide me with a patient's drug list, I'm not just going to tell you that he's a poor metabolizer, avoid codeine. I'm going to tell you what meds you might want to consider. Okay? Um, we saw the example of citalopram too. So, so here's this patient was a real patient. He was taking high, uh, Norco, Paxil, Carvedilol, and Losartan. And it turns out he had uh, two of those meds were so severe in terms of the drug gene conflicts he had that they were contraindicated in this patient. And we provided several different alternatives uh, in, in this patient for his antidepressant as well as for his opiate. Um, and we also provided an alternative beta blocker uh, to consider uh, for the patient as well. Um, interestingly, uh, we also then ran his drug-drug interactions because the genetics are extremely important, but they set the baseline of metabolic capacity, on top of which drug interactions and other comorbidities and age and BMI all affect dose requirements and likelihood of efficacy. So we, we never say that the genetics are all you need. The genetics are the baseline upon which you can use all of those other clinical factors to help decide what drug is going to treat symptoms best at what dose. Okay, so drug-drug interactions also go on this report, and you can see here that this patient had one, two, three, four, five, actually six, because he had a double uh, one here, uh, six significant moderate to severe drug-drug uh, interactions. The patient was on eight other meds down here. So this patient was on 12 meds, four of which had significant genetic relevance, six of which had drug-drug interactions, and eight of which we couldn't say anything about genetically, uh, but we certainly had a lot of drug-drug interactions associated with them. So this is the type of actionable information you see from a, a, a drug gene interaction report. Okay, here's an interesting one. True or false, concomitant administration of tamoxifen, which is a prodrug, with a 2D6 inhibitor like paroxetine, the antidepressant paroxetine, will affect tamoxifen efficacy in 2D6 poor metabolizers. True or false? You have a 50-50 shot if you take a guess. So True. True. Walk me through it. You know a poor metabolizer? Mm-hmm. He's metabolizing it a little bit, and for inhibiting it, he's less and less, I guess. So it's affecting it, but it might not affect it. The best form of that is respect. No metabolism? Poor metabolizers have no metabolism. So if there's an inhibitor or something that will work in the first place. You're exactly right. If you're a poor metabolizer, there is no metabolic activity to inhibit. You have none through 2D6. You're right that tamoxifen isn't solely exclusively metabolized by 2D6. However, the endoxifen active metabolite is produced by 2D6. Okay? So you have to have significant 2D6 activity in order to do produce therapeutic endoxifen concentrations. Folks who are poor metabolizers have a six-fold increased risk of breast cancer recurrence when treated with tamoxifen because of that low active metabolite. But the question about an inhibitor comes up because there are FDA guidelines that say don't give 2D6 inhibitors to patients with tamoxifen. Pick a different antidepressant but that only matters if they have residual 2D6 activity to begin with. So it gets back to the point of genetics set the baseline of metabolic activity. If this person has no metabolic activity of 2D6, the drug-drug interaction that would have otherwise been an inhibitor is irrelevant. It has, doesn't have anything to inhibit. Okay? The bigger problem is not which antidepressant to give. The bigger problem is that tamoxifen is likely to be subtherapeutic. Okay? So, again, the genetics are a part of what you guys do every day when you consider multi-drug regimens, when you consider uh, comorbidities as a part of, of how you choose medications and how you decide to dose escalate. Okay? I think that was it. <laughs>
This is just the process map uh, that we've come up with for U of L um, for implementing. So, a patient gets seen at one of the outpatient clinics, for example, the HCOC or maybe the AIM clinic as we roll this out. Um, uh, the practitioner, you guys go through that patient selection criteria, decide that the patient needs it. We get a cheek swab. It's a nice, easy cheek swab. Courier comes and picks it up uh, in 48 to 72 hours. Typically, you get the results back. That is that full drug, gene, drug, drug, conflict resolution uh, pathway uh, or, or report, I should say. Uh, it depends. So Medicare will pay for it for quite a few diagnoses. They have come back and said that many of these are uh, medically necessary, particularly for depression. Uh, there's one for Huntington's. Um, for clopidogrel, it's medically necessary. Uh, so Medicare will pay for quite a few of these conditions for testing. The private insurances are honestly a little bit all over the board. Uh, some pay, some call it experimental and won't pay, some call it experimental and pay anyway. Um, so it's a little all over the place. Um, we actually have uh, some client pricing that we're working out for U of L and financial assistance programs as well. So the good news is, is Medicare is moving in the right direction. And this, this was just November of 2014 when they laid down the, the um, determination that it is medically necessary for certain conditions. studies on cost savings here. So I know, yeah. for example, just generically that like it's acceptable, it's considered a good buy in America if we get $15,000 for every uh, adjusted life year, right? For yes, absolutely. So is there a number on your test that says I can either get this is how much it costs to save a life for a year or this is how much I can save by not doing Absolutely. It's a great question. I have five or six slides that talk just about cost effectiveness of these modalities, and I took them all out. <laughs> um, for example, there was a study, I think it was two years ago, that modeled the clopidogrel story. Um, and this was right before Plavix went generic, okay? Um, but even then, even with modeling it going generic, the cost of intervention per quality life year was $4,000, so well below that $50,000. Uh, really interesting uh, study, uh, you know, just demonstrating that not all interventions are cost neutral or cost savings, uh, but they are quality of life saving and cost effective uh, when, they, when they're below that threshold. There are some other studies. Uh, there was one in 2013 looking at the psychotropics, and they decreased their costs in their study from like $67,000 to treat a person uh, with psychosis who had the pharmacogenetic variants and weren't treated with pharmacogenetic guidance versus those who did get the guidance uh, down to like $23,000. So they saved over $40,000 in this cohort of patients by using pharmacogenetic guidance in the psychotropic field too. So they're, they're, we're really starting to see more and more of those types of studies coming out. Now that we understand what the outcomes are, we know how to go power those studies to look at cost effectiveness. So another question I have is, uh, so... Yeah, so I wonder if you can move this from individual into population study. So, for example, have you seen enough of a difference between two, say, races of people or two groups of people in a country or, you know, whatever, the northeast here versus the southwest here? Is there enough variance or is it just that in each race of in each race there's so much variation that you would never be able to tell the difference between we we absolutely know that there are racial differences in the frequency of these uh, phenotypes. Um, so, so how pharmacogenetics labs should account for that is when they know they have a racially diverse population of patients they serve, they should maximize the sensitivity of their assays, of their tests, by incorporating all of those known genetic variants. So, for example, my lab tests for 
19 different known variants just in the 2D6 gene. So I look at 19 different things. Some are only found in Asians. Some are only found in, in African Americans. Uh, and of course the most common ones in the Caucasian population we see a lot. Uh, but we, we test patients all over the country and we do a little bit of international work too. So that's the way you account for it. We absolutely know that there are different, uh, that there are different, um, uh, associations to these things. So if I had a homogenous group of people, you could hone in that test to that group of people. For example, obviously I have a little self-interest in this, so that's why I asked the question. Um, so if I were, I'm moving to Africa to do this. Okay. So if I were to take a tribe of people in Africa, where it's a very resource limited setting, take a certain sampling of those people, I could tell the government in Africa that you can't afford all of these antihypertensives. But if you want the biggest bang for your buck, it's most likely that your ACE inhibitor is going to work based on the genetic testing of your people. Absolutely, absolutely. And your ability to use the genetic test uh, to highlight that uh, would be dependent on which variants, you, how you designed the assay, how you designed the genetic test. So you probably wouldn't have the most common genetic variants in Caucasians in that particular assay if all you're doing is that particular subset of, of the population. Uh, you might be able to pick five or six variants instead of 19 um, and have a 99.9% .9 sensitivity that you're going to identify the poor metabolizers and the ultra-rapid metabolizers in that population that allows you to say, yeah, he probably needs a calcium channel blocker or whatever. All the, do you have any outcomes uh, studies on parameters that are assessed objectively, like blood pressure, heart rate, and stuff? Because what I'm trying to get to is how often does the serum level of blood X, say it's 5 in him and 2 in me, does that mean there's a difference in blood pressure effect? Because that's just telling you the blood level. Does it tell you about delivery, receptor concentration, penetration, and all these kind of things? So just looking at one isolated thing, if you don't look at outcomes, uh, might just confirm us. So, are there any outcomes that are okay? all kinds? All kinds. Uh, for example, depression or pain. So those are always assessed objectively. Those are convenient targets, right? So, what about like blood pressure, heart rate, and drugs that assess those? Do we have outcomes? How about stent thrombosis? Post stent. Or platelets, for example, then get into that. Right? And the first slide showed the, the deaths in the, in, the, in, the, in the U.S. Yes. So adverse drug reactions are what, the fourth, third, fourth? They were the fourth in that study. The most common death, so that's our outcome. If you're dead, you're dead. You know, so what I think... That's, that's the really unfortunate outcome, yeah. The here is not whether you're going to take double the drug and get a, a blood pressure. One of the first issues before we get to that is, I'm not going to give you a drug that's going to make you susceptible to a bad outcome with no benefit whatsoever. So, you're, but your your point about using surrogate, but your point about um, definitive objective outcomes versus serum levels, which can vary dramatically across patients and across populations. Warfarin is actually a really good example of that because for years we've talked about how the pharmacogenetic variants in warfarin affect warfarin dose requirement and affect your INR, which in and of itself is a surrogate marker for blood concentration, right? In 2005, we finally identified the vitamin K epoxide reductase gene. It wasn't until 2005. Think about how long Coumadin has been on the market. Not until 2005 did we know what gene it was. When we identified that gene with the Human Genome Project and started to do a few studies on it, by 2007, two years later, we had identified uh, the characteristic that causes if it's more common in Asians, that leads to their warfarin sensitivity and increased risk of bleeding. So bleeding being the outcome there, not increased INR as that surrogate marker, but increased bleeding. In fact, just last week I came across a new meta-analysis that came out like two months ago um, that looked at 10 different warfarin pharmacogenetic studies, all prospectively designed trials. And what they demonstrated was that a lot of those trials weren't powered to look at bleeding events or thrombotic events. They were powered to look at those intermediate surrogate, how many increased INRs did we have, right? How, how time and range type of stuff. This meta-analysis actually demonstrated a significantly, uh, in, a significant improvement in the ability to decrease 
those hard outcomes of bleeding events and thrombotic events. I literally just read this like three days ago, and I'm still working on the summary of it. But ab you're absolutely right. The surrogate markers get us to a point of understanding mechanism of effect. But what we need to understand is how does that affect outcomes? And how is that maybe different across populations? We now understand why Asians uh, uh, ethnically have a higher sensitivity to warfarin compared to African Americans. These genetics are, are helping us understand that. Thanks, guys.